This is the lecture video for Chapter 1, Electronic Structure and Bonding. Most of this material will hopefully be a review of general chemistry. The first 15, the first 15 slides of Chapter 1 lecture are an introduction to organic chemistry and an introduction to the lecture note style and how it is organized. So why are we studying chemistry? General chemistry is really an introduction to chemistry where a lot of time is spent on the concepts of atoms, elements in the periodic chart, acids, bases, things like that. It often seems like general chemistry is an eclectic mix of concepts and topics that often don't appear to be related. One jumps from one topic to the next topic without clear connection or a sequence to the material. But all this information is important and it is used as a building block for more focused chemistry topics like organic chemistry. In organic chemistry, we will be discussing molecules, all of which contain carbon. We can use this information to discuss molecules of life, in other words, biochemistry. In biochemistry, we're going to learn about molecules such as carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, enzymes, nucleic acid, which are DNA, RNA, and vitamins. With this knowledge, we can go on to study the chemical processes that are taking place in the organelles of cells in living organisms, the tricarboxylic acid cycle, commonly known as the Krebs cycle, the electron transport chain, phonosynthesis, the urea cycle, etc. With this knowledge, we can go on to discuss cell biology and how the organelles function as a cellular unit, for example, processes like replication, cell division, etc. With this information knowledge, we can discuss the physiology and anatomy of living organisms and how cells function as a tissue or as a discrete organ. And finally, with this knowledge, we can discuss life. All these fields of study together can be classified as vitalism, the chemistry of life. And that's why organic chemistry is so important because it's taking those concepts from general chemistry and making them into molecules that are the basis for life. Organic chemistry is the study of carbon containing compounds. Some examples of these are natural gas, petroleum products, polymers, plastics, rubbers, paper, textiles, drugs, and all those biological chemicals in biochemistry. If we looked at the number of organic molecules out there that we've either synthesized or isolated, there are over 10 million organic compounds known right now. And there's a lot more yet to be discovered. If we look at the periodic table, we represent carbon as a C. It contains six electrons, six protons, and six neutrons. If we look at the other branch of chemistry that contrasts organic chemistry, in other words, molecules that do not contain carbon, we classify those as inorganic chemicals. And the study is inorganic chemistry. Examples of those are sulfuric acid, nitric acid, ores and minerals, rocks, air, baking soda, caustic soda, table salt, metal alloys, such as brass and bronze. There are, however, more elements in organic compounds than just carbon, and I'm going to now talk about the important ones the ones that we study in Chem 321. Of course, in all organic molecules, there is carbon. Notice that it is in column 4A here, meaning that it has four valence electrons. 
Also present in most organic compounds are nitrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen having five valence electrons, oxygen having six valence electrons. There are two other elements that are important for organic compounds when they're related to life. Both phosphorus and sulfur are very important organic elements for biochemical compounds. Other elements that are common are the halogens, the group 7A elements, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Each of those elements contains seven valence electrons. These elements are not commonly found in biochemical compounds, but we use them when we do synthetic organic chemistry. So they're very important for organic chemistry class. Two other elements that are gaining more and more popularity are boron and silicon. In fact, the study of borocarbon and silicarbon studies has grown tremendously over the years. Notice that silicon is right below carbon in the periodic table. We know from general chemistry that elements in a column of the same per in a periodic chart have many of the same physical and chemical properties. This has led scientists to speculate that maybe life could exist somewhere in the universe that is based on silicon rather than carbon. It's kind of an interesting thought process. With that small set of chemical elements, there is a lot of ways they can be bonded together to form molecules, which leads to a significant diversity of organic compounds. These are just some examples here, and I've represented several different ways to actually depict organic molecules. This whole group over here on the left-hand side is known as a space-filling model. This molecule here in the center here is an expanded structural formula of benzene. This molecule is an expanded structural formula of ethane. This is an electrostatic map of formaldehyde. This is actually a ball and stick model of buckyball. And this is a line angle drawing, and it looks very complicated of a synthetic drug that is used in medicine these days. What about CO2 and carbon monoxide, graphene and diamond? They all contain carbon, so are they organic molecules? In fact, we typically classify those as inorganic because they're not generated by life. They're literally generated by star explosions and high pressure places in the world. Let's look specifically now at ethanol. Okay? And let's look at the different ways that organic chemists depict them, the different structures that we use to represent them on paper. Most ethanol in the world is synthesized by a fermentation process followed by a distillation process of corn. That alcohol is used for many different purposes. It is a major ingredient now of our gasoline, where we range from about 5% up to about 85% ethanol. It is also used for hard liquor like whiskey and tequila. Its significant quantity is used in beer production. You can also go down to the hardware store and buy a can of denatured alcohol. Denatured is alcohol, ethanol, that just has some additives put into it so you can't drink it. In the laboratory we have squeeze bottles full of ethanol. It's a very good solvent and we can use it to run chemical reactions. And right now it is used in hand sanitizer as a disinfectant. There are many ways to represent ethanol on paper. The most common method is actually a molecular formula. We can see here in this molecular formula for ethanol that I have two carbons, 
six hydrogens and one oxygen. That tells me the elements that are in ethanol, but it doesn't tell me how they are connected, what, how they are bonded together, these different atoms. Another way to have a molecular formula is to separate out one of those hydrogens and put it closer to the oxygen that it's actually bound to. So I have two carbons that are bound together. I have five hydrogens that are bound to carbon. I have one hydrogen here that is bound to oxygen. Another way to represent a molecular formula for ethanol is to use the abbreviation ET. That stands for F, and the OH stands for alcohol or all, so this would represent ethanol. If we want a little more structural information, we could have a condensed structural formula. In this case, I, this car, first carbon here is bound to that second carbon, which is bound to that oxygen, which is bound to that hydrogen. These three hydrogens are bound to the carbon. These two hydrogens are bound to that carbon. We often represent those bonds between the carbons and the oxygen as lines, but we could also just leave those out, and this is also another common methodology for representing ethanol. In general chemistry, we often drew Lewis dot structures, often called electron dot formulas for different molecules. This is actually a three-dimensional depiction of ethanol, where each dot represents one electron, where two electrons represent a bond, or a lone pair of electrons on a heteroatom, like the oxygen. Drawing out all those dots is a lot of work, and we quickly, very seldom do that in organic chemistry. We often migrate over to the Lewis line dot structure, which, which is often called a structural formula. Here, we replace all of the dots with lines, so each one of these lines represents two electrons, and they represent a bond. So I have a hydrogen with a bond to carbon, hydrogen bond to carbon, carbon bond to carbon, carbon bond to oxygen, oxygen bond to hydrogen. Occasionally, we'll also add in the lone pair of electrons on the oxygen. Those lone pair of electrons are important because they're negative, electrons are negative, and that's where chemistry happens. Things that are positive are attracted to those electrons. If we want to draw our chemical formula with a little more three-dimensional character to it, we often in organic chemistry draw the stereochemical formula as shown over here. Notice I have wedges now and I have dashes. The wedges imply that this hydrogen is coming out of the screen toward you. These dashes imply that the hy this hydrogen is going back into the board this line implies that this bond, or this hydrogen, is in the plane of the board. So this hydrogen, this, what is that intersection? That's actually a carbon. We get lazy in organic chemistry, and we start to even leave out some of the atoms. So this is a hydrogen, a carbon, a carbon, and an oxygen, and they're all in the plane of the board. This hydrogen and this hydrogen are coming out of the plane of the board while this hydrogen and this hydrogen are going back into the plane of the board. We're going to learn in a few slides that this actually is a tetrahedral structure, and we can represent that tetrahedral structure by this line wedge and dash type of structure. We often get very lazy in organic chemistry. We want to draw things as simple as possible. So we have something called a line angle formula. Our textbook calls it a skeletal formula. So this end of this line represents a carbon. This intersection between the two lines represents a carbon. And then we typically draw in the heteroatoms or the functional group here. Notice I've draw I haven't drawn any hydrogens on this carbon atom. They're just implied. So this carbon is represented by that carbon. 
we just leave off the two hydrogens. This carbon should have three hydrogens on it, but we just leave them off. Just about every carbon atom in organic chemistry needs to have four bonds to it. If you don't see four bonds to a carbon, assume that it is a hydrogen atom that is just hasn't been written in. If we want to get super 3D, we have some models, some structures called space filling models, where all of these partial hemispheres represent the electron cloud around each of the different atoms in the molecule. So this gray hemisphere here is the hydrogen electron cloud. Red is the oxygen electron cloud. Hydrogen electron cloud, hydrogen electron cloud. And you can see there's some hidden in here in the back that are hydrogen also. The two black hemispheres represent the electron cloud of the carbon atoms. Notice this is still just an approximation because the electron clouds do extend much further than this, but then you can't see anything. Another common methodology for drawing organic molecules is the ball and stick model, where we represent each atom as a ball and we color those. So the black ones are carbon, the gray ones are hydrogen, and the red one is oxygen. And you can see here we've drawn sticks between them indicating that there are connection between them or bonds between the different atoms. This is very common when we're using model kits to actually build models of organic molecules. And finally, we have an electrostatic map or an electron density model of ethanol. In this, you can see underlying here is actually a ball and stick model. But what we've drawn around them is the charge density or electron density around the molecule. Red representing high electron density or negative charge. Blue representing less electron density or positive charge. This type of electrostatic model is very useful when we're trying to predict chemistry. I know that there's a lot of electron density right here because I have a lone pair of electrons. And if I remember from general chemistry, positive things are attracted to negative things. So that's where chemistry happens. Up here, where I have these dark blue areas, that's positive. And we know from general chemistry that negative things are attracted to positive things. So that's where chemistry happens also. So I just said that the chemistry is happening near the negative lone pair of electrons and oxygen, or that positive part near the hydrogen on the oxygen. We call that a functional group. And so organic molecules are often classified, but which type of functional groups they actually contain. So the OH in ethanol is an alcohol functional group with two carbons attached to it. Specific functional groups are responsible for the physical characteristics, physical properties of organic molecules, and most of the time they are responsible for the chemical reactivity of a molecule. In general, we can talk about organic chemistry as the study of reactions or interconversions of functional groups. Can we change that hydroxyl group into a different functional group? Like, can we change the OH into a chlorine? Can we change the OH into a nitrogen? That's a lot of the things that organic chemists do. There are three broad classes of organic compounds based on what type of atoms in an organic molecule they have. We have one, hydrocarbons. Those are organic molecules that only contain carbon and hydrogen. We have organic molecules that contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We're going to call those like alcohols, aldehydes, ethers. There are organic molecules that contain carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, like amines and amides and nitrogen com nitro compounds. There are a few other elements that are often included in organic chemistry, but they're not as prevalent the halogens, which we use for synthetic organic chemistry, 
sulfur and phosphorus, which are biochemistry elements, and then boron and silicon, which are different classes of organic molecules. Let's look at this big molecule over here on the right, and let's identify some of the different functional groups. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look for those atoms like that are not carbon, that are not hydrogen, or that have extra bonds in them. Those are going to be my functional groups. So if I look at this nitrogen next to an oxygen, that is an amide, this is an alkene, that's a carbon-carbon double bond. Here I have an oxygen between two carbons, that's an ether. I have a six-membered carbon ring that has three double bonds. We're going to learn that's called either an aerial, arene, or an aromatic functional group. Down here is another ether. That's an oxygen between two carbons. I have a nitrogen with two oxygens on it attached to a carbon. That's a nitro functional group. Here I have an OH. We already know that that's an alcohol functional group. It just happens to be attached to a much larger molecule. Here I have a carbon with a double bond oxygen that does not have a nitrogen near it. That is a ketone functional group. This is a triple bond between two carbon atoms. That is an alkyne functional group. Here I have a carbon with a halogen attached to it. We call that an alkyl halide halide, meaning one of the four different halogens, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and fluorine. And finally, I have down here a carbon with a double bond oxygen that's at the end of a carbon chain. That is called an aldehyde. These are the different functional groups that we'll be studying this semester in organic chemistry. Here is another organic molecule, codeine that contains functional groups. This single molecule contains an ether, an aromatic, another ether, an amine, an alkene, and an alcohol. In fact, there are billions and billions of possibilities of organic molecules, and most of them have not been identified or have not been synthesized. So there's a lot of opportunity for organic chemists to make new drugs, new polymers, new types of materials that we can use in our society. Let's now look at what we're going to be studying this semester in Chem 321. We're going to be studying alkenes, alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, alcohols, phenyl groups, and benzyl groups, these ones being the aromatic compounds. And then we're going to sneak in some sulfur chemistry because it's very similar to alcohol chemistry. Remember back at the periodic chart? The sulfur is right below oxygen in the periodic chart. So a lot of the same chemical properties and chemical reactivities happen for sulfur-containing compounds as oxygen-containing compounds. In Chem 322, next semester's organic chemistry, we're going to fill in a whole bunch more functional groups. Notice that there's a lot of them that are not studied in these organic chemistry classes. These are usually left over for graduate level classes. I hope somebody in the class takes graduate level organic chemistry someday. Organic chemistry this semester can be broken down into three different broad categories. The fundamentals of organic chemistry, the models that we're going to discuss, and synthesis of organic compounds with the goal being synthesis, meaning we're going to take some reactants and we're going to react them to form products. And actually, this will be very beneficial when you take organic chemistry lab next semester or in the coming year. So in the fundamentals topic, we're going to discuss the and study these functional groups, alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, and aromatic compounds, and alcohols. We're then going to use some nomenclature, naming organic compounds, we're going to learn three different ways to name organic compounds. The common names, ones that are common out there. We're going to learn the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemical Systematic Way of Naming Organic Compounds. Unfortunately, we have to learn two of these. 
There's an old methodology from 1972 that was developed, and then there's a new methodology from 1997 that was developed, and we have to learn them both because they're still being used today. We're also then going to learn physical properties. Specifically, we're going to be discussing boiling points of organic molecules and trends, melting points of organic molecules and trends, density, and solubility. Next semester, we're going to be putting all that together in the fundamentals and doing analysis using ultraviolet visible spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy, mass spectroscopy, which you might have some experience in general chemistry, and nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. All really fun things to do. Once we've learned these fundamentals, we're going to put them together because we want to know how atoms bond. So there are some models that have come together. We're going to discuss a quantum mechanical model, and we're going to discuss a hybridized quantum mechanical model so we can use these models to predict chemistry, predict how reactants will become products. We're also going to discuss some models that are mechanisms which show how we have free radicals, single electrons reacting with other atoms that have single electrons to form bonds. We're specifically in this semester going to talk about substitution reactions and the mechanisms for those and elimination reactions. A substitution reaction is where we have one functional com group come in and actually substitute for an existing functional group. Elimination reactions are where we eliminate a functional group to form a hydrocarbon. In the lecture material for this semester, I have organized it with some color coding and some italics. If you see something in dark red and in bold, that's usually a term or a concept or a name that you need to know and need to be recognized readily. If it's a dark blue, it's just for emphasis on that slide. If I have bright red text, that's usually the answers to practice problems or it's the movement of electrons, meaning I have arrows that I draw that show electrons moving from one atom to another atom or moving from one bond to an atom. The dark green text on the slides for this semester are the names of different organic molecules. That's the 1973 IUPAC names and the 1992 IUPAC names and the common chemical names. Anything in black is just general discussion to fill in some of the details on each of the slides.